power and healing and miracles. And in fact, for those who write titles, yes. Power, Healing, and Miracles might be a good title for this one. <clears throat> power, Healing, and Miracles. First Corinthians. <clears throat> We may need to make an, make an old rule new again, and that is that, that when five minutes before class begins, we start getting ready and uh, can enter into it more efficiently than what we're doing now. Okay, 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1. And the biggest culprit is that blonde lady that's going out the back door right there. <clears throat> I will have a talk, another talk with her. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, if you'll turn with me to John chapter 6, we'll see the outworking of this. John, Gospel of John chap chapter 6, as Jesus speaks, and that was, they speak to him. <clears throat> And um, we're going to be looking at this a little more, so I'm going to go ahead and read uh, from verse 30, John 6, verse 30, down a few verses. <clears throat> they say, Therefore unto him, unto Jesus, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. <clears throat> um, the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, they understood power, healing, miracles, but they didn't understand the source. They didn't understand the spirit behind them. They only understood them as supernatural manifestations. All right, now that's pretty much a modern day church that believes in miracles and things. They believe in supernatural manifestations. <clears throat> um, and, and in other words, Israel believed uh, that Jesus was endowed with certain attributes which could meet their need. All right. Now that's, that's just, that is an explanation of modern day Christianity as far as believing in God. They believe that he is endowed with certain attributes that can meet their need. In other words, one reason why I might join myself to God, come down to an altar and pray, is because he is endowed with attributes that can meet my need, that can make life more comfortable or make life tolerable, or on and on and on. <clears throat> They seek after a sign. They seek after some thing that will bless them, that will help them, that will minister to them, that will. And pretty much nowadays, the old time altar call is over with, and now there's a new altar call, and that is you come down to an altar to get something from God or get God to do something for you. Whereas. In the old days, you used to come down to an altar to give up something for God. And it was a genuine, heartfelt thing that would happen when you came to the altar. So altar calls weren't quite as big back then as they are now. They're massive today <clears throat> because everybody wants to get some. Come down and get. You know, nobody in the Old Testament understood going to an altar to get. They all understood that there was loss and uh, sacrifice, more, more importantly, sacrifice at the altar. And so um, 
God is in is viewed as one who is endowed with greater attributes than most. Therefore, he is in a better position to help me. <clears throat> um, let's look in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Of course, I crammed all my notes just before chapter 22 so that I can't even find the Bible. I got so much stuff back here. Revelation 22. Let's just read verse 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 kinds of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. <clears throat> Israel saw the power. They saw the healing, they saw the miracle, they saw the manifestation, but they did not see the selfless nature that was the fountainhead, that was the the source of all of the things that they got from God. They didn't see the lamb. They didn't see the selfless uh, one from whom it came. They saw him as great deity, not great self-giving. And so um, they, they missed the fact that God did what he did in self-giving. They looked at him and they connected every miracle and every act of power and every act of healing. <clears throat> they connected it with one who possesses power and talents that can serve their interest. I mean, that's why, you know, if you're an Israelite, that's why we serve the living God, because he can do more for us than your God. And that's the platform by which we try to uh, proselytize, by which we try to gain people to join with us. Our God can do more than your God for you. Our lives are enriched because of uh, our God possesses great power. Not really the thought that he is so selfless that he does these things for us. No, no real genuine mention of his his being, of his nature, simply that he, it, it would be like running into a rich man that would start helping you out. Doesn't matter what, what he's like at home or on his, how he got the money or whatever. The only thing I care about is that he gives to me. He helps me. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, it become, God becomes a means to an end. God becomes a means for serving my interests, serving my expectations. <clears throat> um, you know, I've been talking about official power versus power, or, or official glory versus the glory of nature, and how Jesus hid so much. But when it comes to healing and power and miracles, we say, but he was flashy. You know, I mean, you can think that. You can, especially if you're coming out of the church world, you can think, well, he's, you know, he's flashy. Um, but let's say, you know, talking about his miracles and power. But they were not done out of that motive, out of being flashy, but out of selflessness. He just gave of himself. 
He saw a need. People opened themselves to him in that way where he could be self-giving and he would do it. Um, Anytime Jesus perceived that people took it wrong or would magnify the act as something or magnify it to glorify him, he would hide it. And this is an amazing truth throughout the Bible if you, and New Testament and Gospels that he would perceive that somebody's taking this wrong or somebody's glorifying him in a way. And when I say glorifying him, not glorifying him for his nature, for his power, for his ability to help me. Therefore, I glorify you. You know, however, if you don't help me, I don't glorify you. That's, that's not seeing him for who he is and glorifying for him for who he is. That's glorifying him for what he does, and not even just what he does, but what he does for me. You know, and you hear of it in the, in the modern day church a lot, how if God doesn't come through, like somebody, somebody in the family gets sick and they start believing he's going to be healed, he's gonna, God's going to heal him, God, I just believe it, I just know that he is. And I, I, there was a recent situation where I was aware of that that happened. And so they start having faith that he's going to do that. Um, and if he doesn't do it, they're, they don't know him. They just know, you know, you didn't come through for me. Okay, but listen, you didn't come through for me in the manner that I wanted you to. And that's the deal, in the manner that I wanted you to. No, no recognition. I mean, I hear people say stuff about God all the time about, you know, they don't realize it, but, you know, they're saying negative things, you know, well, God didn't do this or God, you know, and they're saying stuff. They don't realize they're talking bad about my own father. You know, but I don't get caught up in that. I know my father. I know the Lord. I know the Holy Spirit. I know their spirit. And I may not be able to give an explanation for everything, but I know that in everything that he does, he does it out of love because he is love. He does it out of selflessness because he is love. He is selfless. But he doesn't do it to satisfy my wants. He does what he does to truly, truly help, to truly, truly help us. <clears throat> um, miracles were not miracles to him. And that's a huge point right there. If everybody could get that out of this one class, that would be you would fulfill this class. Miracles were not miracles to him. Uh, look over in, let's, there's a couple of scriptures, uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And I want to show you something, and I wonder if you ever wondered about it. Luke chapter 6. Verse 17, <clears throat> and he, speaking of Jesus, and he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great, great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their disease, diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went, and if you look in the King James Version, it says, the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him, and healed them all. Okay, keep that in mind. Now let's go over to uh, Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> verse 
verse 24. Mark 5, 24. And Jesus went with him, and many people followed him and crowded him. And a certain woman who had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the crowd behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Personally, I always wondered when I would read that, why did it say virtue? And here's, here's why it would be a thing to me. Because what is virtuous? Power is not virtuous. You can, you can have power and, and, and wield that power, even wield it in a good way, and it's not virtue in itself. The virtue would be the motive that came out of it. In other words, you could help people, you could have power and money and influence and help somebody and do it all selfishly, and there is no virtue to it. In fact, it's the opposite of virtue. And, and that person may think, well, I, I healed many people, I helped many people, I did one, many wonderful works, and the Lord will say, I never knew you. Um, because we think it's the act and not the motive. And therefore, Christians are constantly busy doing things, believing that the thing itself is virtuous. And it's not. It's not. Virtue went out of Jesus. Virtue went out of him. Um, if it were just power, then so be it. But virtue reaches out for the needs of others. It is self-giving, not just random power. That's why virtue went out of him, not just power. Right, absolutely. I hope everybody heard that because, you know, everybody was touching him, but virtue went out of him to this one. And, and um, I believe that that's a, a two-way street in a certain sense. Well, I won't get into that. Um, all right, let's talk about... <clears throat> Let's talk about Israel's view because it's um, many times when we read the Bible, the view we have is the, the, the life we live now, the place we live with the cultural understanding that we have. Okay? For, for example, um, uh, Paul came to Jesus. This is the example I always use. Paul came to Jesus. Well, what did that mean? Uh, well, when he came to Jesus, uh, then he came to miracles and healings and blessings and uh, um, raising the dead, and, and that's what we, coming to Jesus was. But the Jews, before Jesus ever came, had all of that kind of stuff all the time. I mean, there, was, there were people, and I, I have uh, <clears throat> the example of uh, Elisha written down here, and we can look at a few of the, the examples in Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 4. Uh, in my Bible at the top of verse 38 says two further miracles. So that means something, you know, there was things going on before this also. Um, 2 Kings 4 and verse 44. And um, it's, it, it's talking about the... What is... Isn't this the one... Yeah, there was poison in the pot. And uh, so none of them had any food. And then he... Uh, 
they ended up, the, the food ended up being healed. He put meal in the pot in verse 44. So he set it before them, and they did eat, and left some according to the word of the Lord. So here he is. He's feeding a multitude. He's feeding a multitude. And then in chapter 5, which is just right over in verse 14, then when he down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So he feeds the multitudes. He's healing a leper. Um, back in uh, chapter 4 and verse 32, And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and, and lay upon his bed. And, of course, he ends up raising the kid from the dead. And he did that another time in chapter 13. <clears throat> um, our view, our view is um, when you, if you come to Jesus, it's going to be a life of miracles and God giving you direction for your life and all this stuff, that that's what coming to, to, to God was. Well, they had the true God. You know, they had the true God already. What was the difference that Jesus brought? And that's the thing. When Jesus came, he looked no different than Elisha or any of the other guys. He was doing the same kind of stuff. In fact... Um, you know, we look at it and we go, well, Jesus was really different because he raised people from the dead. Elisha raised two people from the dead. I mean, that's pretty, you know. But if you're used to that, if that's your history, your, you know, Israel, if that's your history, it's not that big a deal in the sense that you, uh, in other words, I've probably got it written here, but in other words, Many people before you came and did this and you didn't think they were God thought never crossed your mind that they were God or that this was proof that they were God. You following? But we say that's proof that he was God. Isn't that interesting that we make that one of the biggest proofs that he was God? Well, then Elijah might have been God, huh? Or Elijah or any number of these people may have been God. no. But because we're not Jewish, because we don't have the, the history that they had, this is all new to us, but it wasn't new to them. That's important to realize. And so, yes? Um, that's an interesting thing. Uh, the was the fact that uh, during Jesus' time, you had two sorcerers that uh, in the Muslim uh, society. And so people were used to seeing them. You know, so when Jesus did miracles, you know, um, you know, the question was raised up, well, why, did, why didn't everybody bring Jesus? And it's not like now. You know, we look at that and we say, ah, oh, you know, but we don't realize. There were a lot of people doing that back then. Right. Right. I mean, you know, it was, it was a consistent thing, particularly from the time of Moses. I mean, they, you know. They went all the way through the wilderness without their shoes wearing out and all this kind of stuff. And so if God does a miracle, I mean, you know, these boots I got on right here are miracle boots then. I've had them so long I can't even tell you, you know. But I don't believe it's just because he has power and he's come to help us out. I believe it's because he cares and he's selfless and he's self-giving. And if we never see his heart and if we never see the source, if we never see the throne and the lamb on the throne and where it's flowing out from, we never... We, in, in our mind, we just see deity. We just see God. Okay, oh God, that's what we look at. Oh God, deity meaning one with the, with the power, the miracles, and the healings who can fix everything. Oh God, oh deity. And that's how we pray. And that's the focus. And that's the picture in our mind. And that's where we're going. Instead of saying, oh Lamb on the throne from whom all of this flows and touches and brings healing the tree from it <coughs> from this <coughs> flow from you comes a tree of life and from the tree of life brings healing to the nations yes
The fact that that river brings healing is not as much an attribute of it as that it flows to others. Right. That's the essence of that river more than its ability to get healing. And that's why I said uh, statement: uh, miracles, miracles were not miracles to him. I mean, that's a pretty earth-shattering statement if you truly comprehend it, that miracles were not miracles to him. It was just avenues of self-giving from him and from the Father through him. Um, let me read a statement here. Before Jesus came, many prophets and saints worked miracles, delivered the people, were seen as great among the people. Because of this, the miracles of Jesus did not cause the people of Israel to think he was God. Even the people said, Moses did miracles among us and fed us, as if to say, Jesus, be like the other great men before you and give us bread from heaven. And what was Jesus' response? I got news for you. I'm not like the others. I am the source of selflessness. And that Moses didn't give you that. That came, it has to come from one of the Godhead because we're the only ones that are truly selfless. pretty powerful when you realize that what the you know because don't you hear sometimes the people in the bible say stuff to jesus and he responds back and you kind of go well, i don't really get what he means by that well there it is on that one he's he's going to you know they're going do miracles like moses and he's saying look this isn't about first of all moses didn't do that my father did that and second of all He's giving you the true bread from heaven right now, the true source, the true staff of life. <clears throat> um, all right, let's go back to that. Let's look at that verse again, John 6. I should have had you keep your place there because I knew we'd come back to it. But uh, it's a, we started in verse 30. <clears throat> of course, their immediate response after that was, then said they unto him, verse 34, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the source of all of this. <clears throat> so, um, let's see. Jesus' power and miracles were seen as just another man of God as far as Israel is concerned. And were not seen as seen as signs of who he was. Essence, again, essence, essence. Are we, com are we contemplating, you know, again, every circumference has a center. All that flows around this is not the explanation Unless you see the heart, you're not going to understand the miracles and the power and the healings. You're just going to assume it's deity. And again, I'm trying to break through here. Israel didn't see it as deity. They didn't. I mean, we spiritualize this thing by saying, I'm going to God for this, and I got this from God. Well, they didn't even go that far. They didn't make it even that spiritual, but it's not spiritual in the sense that we're still not con comprehending God in the true meaning of who he is, and we have redefined God as omnipotence. You would say, um, you know, you ever heard somebody say omnipotent God? Omnipotence being uh, all-powerful. Then you just call him omnipotent. Not God. Not comprehending uh, that he's, he never did a miracle in his mind. He only did what he could in selfless ways to touch and to help others as they would allow that. <clears throat> Um, to them they were gifts from God but did not make him God but every circumference I already said that okay <clears throat> make sure we got this um, they were so selfish that they could not discern how freely Jesus gave to them 
though they didn't deserve it. And he did freely give, folks. My God, he freely gave. The whole time he walked this earth, he freely gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave under weariness and gave under hunger himself and gave under tiredness and he gave and gave and gave because that's who he is. But they say, well, he's God, so... um, he has the power, and he's got so much more power than even what he's giving that this is no drain on him at all. You see, it's, it's, it's a total disregard for his person to get at his goods. <clears throat> so I'll read, go ahead. Of being a son of man, of his empty. That's... That's right. Total disregard of his manhood, of being son of man. But I mean, I mean, really, really honestly, with all your heart, consider how many people do you think really understand the one seated at the right hand of the Father is the Son of Man now? You ever, you ever read the scripture uh, about someone coming back in the sky with ten thousands of angels and someone coming back on a white? Anybody ever read that? What, what's the name? Son of Man. What? What? He's coming with 10,000 angels and everything, and he's still not grabbing hold of official glory. Son of God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that, you know, and you begin to see these things, and you just melt. You, your heart is humbled, and you just want to honor him for who he is instead of, um, not just what he does, but instead of honoring him in the way that religion has taught me. I would, you know, I'd like to know him for myself. I would like to relate to him as I want to, meaning as he wants to, but I mean as not the way it has been ordered by religion and preachers forever, but to truly find the circumference on my own and quit dallying in the circum or the uh, yeah the circumference of it. Well, only the Holy Spirit can bring you there, and only a broken and contrite heart will be a true sacrifice that will, you know. You know. If you exalt yourself, isn't that, I mean isn't that in, there? There we go. Official glory, glory of nature. If you exalt yourself, if you, if you go for official glory, he'll bring you down. But if you go for the glory of nature, he'll exalt you. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I mean, I do, but I, I... It is the exact opposite of human nature. And therefore, it's hidden behind a veil to us. It seems so veiled to us because we don't get it. We don't get it. Did you have your hand up, Greg? Okay. Um, So they were so selfish that they could not discern how freely Jesus gave to them, though undeserved. He knew this. He knew that they were selfish. He knew that they were just getting hold of anything they could for their own advantage, and yet he gave anyway. If that's us and we know people are just selfishly taken from us, we cut them off, baby. We cut them off. Jesus didn't. Why? Somebody tell me why Jesus wouldn't cut them off. For God to give and give and pour out and pour out. Not to mention there was no one on earth who wasn't like that. Right. Yeah. And And the point is that it was nature to him. He wanted to give and give. For God so loved, he gave. Love gives. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is not easily offended. Love is not puffed up. Love is not. But we're not talking about your love. We're talking about love that is God. Our God is love. And all that is, is a, uh, you know, Let's picture again Revelation 22. Let's just take a moment. Uh, 
any of you have a, an imagination there? Just picture the lamb on the throne and picture this pure river of life. River, hmm, didn't say stream. I didn't say creek. A pure river of life flowing out. Okay, hmm, let's see. How long do you think that's going to go on like that? I mean, how long is the flow going to keep going? La, 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 let's put a timer on it here. Um, it's still flowing, it's still going, it's still going, it's still going, it's still going. At what point will it stop? Tell me at what time period. The millennium, right? No, because that's when at least theologians put that in the millennium is what they're talking about with that, you know. Um <clears throat> We're the bricks of the new Jerusalem, the building blocks, the home, the habitation through whom these things flow. Therefore, out of your innermost being shall flow this same river, the river of life. At what point will it stop with him? Or if it'll never stop with him, at what point will it stop with us? That's, that's something we have to discover. Honestly, we have to discover it because if it is Jesus in us, your mind, my mind has many times, my mind has said, that's enough, I've had it, I ain't doing that anymore with that person. I, you know, all they do is, you know, this is all wrong, it's not Jesus, da 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 da, -da. I get in that situation again, the Lord kicks in, and I just give and bless and love, and, and it's like, what the heck is wrong with me, you know? I mean, I don't get mad at them. I go, you're an idiot. And, of course, many of you have looked at me and said the same thing. You're an idiot. Yeah, I mean, I know. I know. And the reason why I've never railed back at you is because I'm an idiot. Because I should have just said, no, you user, you nasty little user. No more. But Jesus kicks in, and you bless, and you just go, look, this is, the, I am going to go with him because I love him. Not because I particularly like this way, but the more I'm related to him, and the more that that flow flows through me, the more I conform to that image. And therefore, it's okay. It's usually not as okay early as it is latter, where it's a lot more okay. Early, it's about finding your position and getting your plan, not being robbed and all this stuff. Later in life, as you get older, you sort of go, you know, I mean, if somebody, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we thought was important or we really wanted and then somebody comes up and goes, you know, I'm going to take that. And you don't fight for it. You go, take it. You know. I mean, you know, Deb's father was, was one who just held on to stuff, you know. And um, I doubt if he's ever going to listen to this, but he, he just held on to stuff. But when he got older and when he just couldn't do anymore and everything, he started giving everything away. I mean, he never gave anything away before that time. Anything that we took, we paid for. But now, man, he's just, you know, because he's 93, isn't that it? 95, something like that. 95, 96 years old, you know. We'll take the lawn tractor. You sure? He'll never get on that lawn tractor again. You know? He doesn't have a yard anymore. He doesn't care about all the things. You know, well, i got to have a lawn tractor. And then, you know, maybe a few years from death, and you're thinking, you know, I don't really need a lawn tractor. I really need some important things now. And one of the important things is family and loving regardless and forgiving and getting all that cleared out of the way and giving. It's funny how that works. <clears throat> anyway, let me make sure I'm 
I really want to finish something here, and I'm, I'm possibly going to do it. Um, <clears throat> the people would bring their sorrow to Christ, but not bring honor to him. Why? Why? Why would they bring their sorrow to him, but not bring honor? Because they recognized that he didn't have to have honor to give, to heal, to bless. All they had to do was present their sorrow and he would, tell, he would be there for them. That's an amazing thing. And so most of the time, nobody, I mean, you think three and a half years and all the people and all the circumstances and all the things he did for people, you'd think somebody would have already picked him up on their shoulders, a bunch of people, rushed into the temple, drug out all the high priests and everybody and said, this guy is way better than you guys. You guys put heavy burdens on us. This guy is bringing freedom and joy and life and peace. Did they ever do that? The closest they got to it was the triumphal entry. And I, uh, next time I share on, which will be my last time to share on the habitation, I'll show you that it was only a triumphal entry. It wasn't a... You know, it didn't get past the entry. <laughs> it was a great entry. You know, you can have a great interest and then flop. Yes. Is yes, there was, and it says that. It says that that he knew that they were going to try to make give him official glory, and he did what? He hid himself. He veiled that kind of glory. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the people would bring sorrow to Christ, but not bring honor to him. However, Jesus met them on whatever basis that they would have him. He would deal with sorrow with tenderness and exhibited the power to relieve it. All right. I want to, how much time we got? Oh, we got way more than I thought. I was rushing through. There were several points I was going to really delve on. But, but here's my thought, and that is um, next Thursday... I'm going to be in Mexico, <clears throat> and then I think there's only two Thursdays after that, I think. So what I'm going to try to do is, is get through this, and then the next class get through that. Uh, what I have for that, <clears throat> for that, and then on the Thursday when I come back from Mexico, <clears throat> do the final two classes on Jesus at the different tables. <clears throat> and then the last Thursday, which normally we would have a class, I'm going to try to get all this done so that we don't have class on that Thursday because <clears throat> we've got graduation and we've got, you know, marriage and we got all kind of stuff, you know, that marriage and stuff. <clears throat> and so... We will, uh, Lord willing, we will uh, be able to skip that class and give us a little break and a little extra time and, you know, be able to do some things. All right, just real quick, <clears throat> turn with me to Matthew 17. I want to talk about the transfiguration <clears throat> and just get this settled because I've been wanting to, I, I'm starting to get to all the stuff I wanted to get to. I'm finally getting to it. I've been talking about it. Now these last couple of classes, I'm going to be able to hit it all. <clears throat> the Transfiguration, Matthew 17, <clears throat> verse 1. And let's just go ahead and read 1 through 9. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain privately. <gasps> what? My translation says privately. What are you doing? What are you doing this stuff privately all the time for? <clears throat> and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine like the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here.
probably last time he ever said that. But anyway, it's good for us to be here. You got Moses, Elijah, you got Jesus glowing. <laughs> it's good for us to be here. Uh, if thou wilt, let us make here three booths, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. <clears throat> While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is raised again from the dead. Let's read a little more. And his disciples asked him, saying, What then say the scribes that are... Okay, let's skip the Elijah part. Let me see. There's a... Uh, verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is epileptic and greatly vexed. For often he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and he departed out of him. And the child was cursed from that, was, I'm sorry, cured from that very hour. Then, well, that's good enough. <clears throat> All right. I said in one of my classes, and... and uh, I said, why, you know, I mean, if the whole point is for Jesus to be recognized as the Son of God, why not just openly go, bong, pull, you know, just show the fullness of who he is and his glory and the angels and all this glorious stuff and everybody go, and, and it be so put forth that everybody just falls to their knees and goes, oh my God, oh my God. Yes, because that's not who he is. Okay, but when I was young and in Bible school, I really seriously wondered that. I thought, you know, this guy could have easily got more converts than he's got now. He could have done it quick. What? The goal was not yeah, and if the goal was for everybody to recognize him as the Son of God on the basis of official glory. Did you hear what I said? Because that's the key. If you don't get that, you you know, if you don't hear that, you don't know where we're, where, what we're talking about and where we're going. Yes. Well, in that revelation, you do revelation by touch. <clears throat> by sense, by eyes, by ears, right. instead of by the Holy Spirit. Well, the thing that somebody said in one of these classes that we've been having is, well, Jesus did do that when I mentioned something like this before. And they said, well, Jesus did do that at the Mount of Transfiguration. But think about it. Jesus did do it, but he only called three people with him. Three people, come on. I mean, he even had 12 disciples. You could have taken 12. He took three. Then they saw his glory. And then immediately Jesus says, don't tell anybody until the Son of Man is risen. Maybe when we have the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and it shows us what the flesh's response even would be to that. It's good for us to be here and let us build one for you, him, and him. You know what I mean? It's like even in the face of that official glory, the flesh can't understand. Right. Exactly. Um, I've turned there, but let me read <clears throat> something that uh, Peter said. This is in Second Peter, um, chapter one. And it says, "Let's see, where is it? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made unto you made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I, I'm just trying to see if... Uh, well, I'll go ahead and read it. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. 
That's official glory, folks. Honor and glory when there was such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He states that they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He states that God the Father gave him honor and glory. All right. Now, if you're, if you're thinking official glory is what it's about, then this was his moment. But Jesus immediately tells him, don't tell anybody. And consider, consider that Philippians, which is where we started this whole thing, where it says, you know, um, let this mind be in you, not to have official glory. But I mean, honestly, that's the translation of that. Let this mind be in you, not to have official glory, but to be willing to hide that, to be willing to, to have it veiled and to walk by the glory of nature. And he says, and because he did that and became obedient even unto death, and it wasn't, it wasn't obedience to even die, it was this spirit of willing to die for everybody, the ungodly, the worst. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name. Folks, Jesus said don't tell anybody because they would have been moved by the externals of the Son of God. And so, what comes to mind real quick is uh, there's a show on recently, something about the boss. And the boss goes and works undercover with his people, you know, head of a big corporation. And he goes into these different cities where his company is, and he works side by side with people that are, you know. And it's funny how they, you know, several of them got fired by little tiny employees, you know, because they couldn't hack the job, you know. And, uh, but, but the point is, is that he never, you know, some of them, when, when at the end, when he walks in the room, they go, hey, Bill, or whatever. And he used a fake name, you know. He goes, they go, hey, Bill, what are you doing? Because they didn't know why they were brought all the way to the headquarters in some, for, you know, some city or some state far away. What are we doing here? And individually, one at a time, sit down. This door opens. This guy walks in, they go, Bill, you know, you were, you know, I was training you. What are you doing here, you know? And he says, well, I'm the CEO and the boss of this whole thing. You're the, you know. They would have been wowed by that had he walked in with a suit, come with a limousine when he first went to work on the job and said, I'm the CEO, train me. I just want to see what this is like. But he walked in unshaven and wearing street clothes and stuff like that, and they treated him a certain way and some of them saw the guy for what he really was and liked him and he liked them and some of them didn't see anything and got fired at the end of the show <laughs> well this sort of lends itself to what we're talking about here that if he just showed that glory everybody would just bow their knee and go but he didn't say in Philippians he'll show you the, the, mo the, the, the glory of his majesty and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. He said those who see that nature, every knee, you know, they're going to bow to that, not the Son of God, to the Son of Man, the progenitor, the prototype of what we're supposed to be like. It's Powerful reality. The Mount of Transfiguration showed his outward glory. The disciples saw him in his highest glory or with unveiled eyes. He was seen as being brighter than the sun. But afterwards, coming down from the mount, Jesus charged the eyewitnesses of his majesty to tell no one. He did not seek to extend people's homage of him on that level but immediately moved by selflessness, serving others. Remember, he came down, started healing people and, and doing stuff. 
um, he did not seek to extend people's homage of him to he could have and he didn't he didn't capitalize on every little vestige of official glory that can oh you know and some people I mean you know they put it on their website or they put it on their newsletter or whatever well so and so said this about me that was good you know you know I still have every letter of everything ever bad said about me I thought seriously one time of just publishing them. Just saying, well, you know, just in case you think I'm so wonderful, maybe you should read this stuff. You know, I, I honestly did. <clears throat> but then I, I didn't. Because they would have killed me. <laughs> he did not seek a higher place among men. On the mount, though exalted by God himself based on official glory, he did not become inflated by it. He would be pure. And when I say he would be pure, I wrote that thinking of this sacrifice, this, this, this meal offering that is, that is pure, this pure flour and these pure ingredients. And I just see this offering going up and all of these things. I don't, I don't just see Jesus, you know, I see all these offerings going up continually a burnt offering and a, the pure flour and pure oil all going up to the Father and the Father just, just taking it in and loving the real reality of it. <clears throat> um, he would be pure. He would not be exalted by his position. He hid himself, made himself of no reputation and veiled the glory. In the transfiguration, he would not be exalted for his glorious majesty, though he was the Son of God. He held all that, waiting to be exalted for who he is and nothing else. He was not seeking for men to see his greatness, but his humility. This is true humility. He humbled himself. He was higher than all men, higher than the situation, higher than they gave him credit. And yet the glorious intrinsic qualities are willingly veiled and he takes a lower place. All right. Good. We're dismissed.